This is Matthew Cratter's Bitcoin University. Today I want to answer the question, who has the most power in Bitcoin? I can think of a number of different constituencies. Number one, Bitcoin node runners that have the power to enforce the consensus rules. In other words, they can reject transactions or blocks that break those consensus rules. They can also decide which unmined transactions to send to other nodes. In other words, their relay or mempool policy. For example, they can choose not to relay op returns greater than 83 bytes or 42 bytes. Bitcoin node runners can also run whatever node software they choose, which is very important to remember. Number two, we have Bitcoin miners and mining pools. They can package up transactions into a block. This means they can also censor transactions by not including them in a block, assuming they're building their own block templates and get to decide which transactions to include in a block. If you're just a hasher, if you're just running a mining rig and you're not building your own block template, this doesn't do you a whole lot of good in terms of power. But basically, Bitcoin miners, mining pools, they extend the chain. They package up transactions into a block. They can also prioritize certain transactions by including them in a block before other transactions. And they can do this based on transaction fees or other economic or even political reasons. Third constituency, I would say, would be the Bitcoin exchanges and crypto exchanges like Coinbase. These have the power to control new large fiat capital flows into and out of Bitcoin. If you want to buy some Bitcoin, you might be able to track down an OG or a whale if you want to buy a lot of them. But more likely, you will go to a Bitcoin or crypto exchange, send them US dollars, and then buy Bitcoin and withdraw it from them. And so exchanges do have quite a bit of power when it comes to the financial side of Bitcoin. Exchanges also get to pick the name of the asset and the ticker. So for example, if there's an asset, do they call it Bitcoin? Do they call it Bcash? which one is the real Bitcoin according to Coinbase or River or Strike, and which one gets the ticker BTC after a fork. That's very important because most retail investors and even some institutional investors are not going to research names. They're just going to buy whatever the ticker is. So that's the power that exchanges have. Then, of course, we have Bitcoin protocol devs that work on the basic underlying protocol. This would include Bitcoin core devs and Bitcoin nots devs who build the node software and set the defaults. And for example, they have the power they can rip out filters like op return, or they can add new filters to filter out things like inscriptions like Bitcoin knots does. So this is a certain degree of power, but remember Bitcoin node runners can cho choose which software to run. So Bitcoin protocol devs can write the software, but they can't force anyone to run the software. Number five, Bitcoin software devs and companies that build wallets and other software that allows normies to interact with Bitcoins. And this would include companies like Sparrow Wallet, Start9, Umbral, Blockstream. These can be open source projects. They can be corporations, for-profit corporations. But basically anyone who's building Bitcoin software, that's not the underlying Bitcoin protocol and consensus rules. Obviously, companies like Start9 and Umbral have a lot of power in the sense that people rely on them for their apps. And so if they make Bitcoin knots, for example, prominent on the homepage, then people have a higher chance of installing that version. Number six, powerful politicians who are paying attention to Bitcoin by either attacking it like Joe Biden and Elizabeth Warren or supporting Bitcoin like Trump or Cynthia Lummis. They're definitely part of the consensus. They can exert they can't change Bitcoin, but they can exert huge pressures on how it evolves in a certain country. Number seven, Bitcoin influencers and educators, whether on YouTube or Twitter or TikTok or wherever, who are themselves frequently beholden to their corporate sponsors. That's important to pay attention to when you're watching someone ask who their sponsors are. Number eight, Bitcoin celebrities and OGs, people the, that everyone knows that have been around for a long time, like Adam Back and Greg Maxwell, Luke Dasher, etc., who may themselves run Bitcoin companies, as is the case with many of these people. Number nine, small, medium, and large hodlers of Bitcoin who can dump or have the potential to dump one side of a fork and buy the other side of a fork, thus exerting financial influence that can determine which side of the fork survives and which side does not. There can obviously also be overlap between these categories. For example, someone could be an OG whale who runs a node, mines Bitcoin, runs a company, and also has a large social media following. So these categories are not watertight, obviously. If you're finding this video interesting so far, just pause really briefly here to ask you to help to support this channel's mission. Hit the subscribe button. That does really help. Leave a like, leave a comment, question, suggestion for a future video, and share this video with a friend or family member. I found this old blog post from Coinbase in which they were talking about what criteria they would use to determine which was 
the asset that was going to be called Bitcoin on their exchange. This was from October 24th, 2017. In our prior blog post, they write, we indicated that at the time of the fork, the existing chain will be called Bitcoin and the Segwit2x fork will be called Bitcoin2x. Segwit2x was basically sort of a corporate upgrade that was being pushed by mostly by large corporations. Uh, and then Coinbase, Coinbase goes on to say, however, some customers asked us to clarify what will happen after the fork. So if there's a fork, if Segwit2x was never really run, but if there had been a fork, uh, Coinbase said, we're gonna call the chain with the most accumulated difficulty Bitcoin. In other words, the chain with the most accumulated proof of work, this would be the chain that the mining pools had done the most work on and also the chain that had been accepted by the nodes. So this is one, intersection here where we can see where nodes, miners, and the exchange in terms of the naming convention of the asset all come together. There are interesting relationships between these different constituencies that make it even more complex, that make Bitcoin consensus, which is really what we're talking about, make it more complex. For example, Bitcoin miners and mining pools need the exchanges in order to sell their mined coins and thus pay their electricity bills. It's unlikely they're going to go to a meetup, for example, and sell their Bitcoin to someone in a crowd. They're going to use exchanges. And if the exchange won't accept their coins, for example, after a fork and there are two versions of the coin, miners may stop mining that particular coin that's not accepted by exchanges. Or if an exchange doesn't support a favored coin, then miners and hodlers may take their business to another exchange. So this goes both ways. It's not like the exchanges have absolute power. Bitcoin Core, Bitcoin Knots devs, for example, this is another example of power. They can roll out a new feature or even new software versions. But if the miners and node runners and companies don't use it, and individual hodlers, obviously, then the new feature or software doesn't matter to the ecosystem simply because there are no auto updates in Bitcoin protocol software. And no one can force you to run node software that you don't want to. And then, of course, lastly, and perhaps most importantly, Bitcoin nodes can withhold block rewards from miners or mining pools by rejecting their newly mined blocks and refusing to add those blocks to their version of the blockchain. And if nodes don't accept their blocks, then miners don't get paid and thus can go bankrupt rather quickly from burning lots of electricity and having no revenue to show for it. This is the basis for the game of chicken known as UASF, which stands for User Activated Soft Fork. This is what we've been talking about is probably gonna happen soon in Bitcoin. Nodes have the ability to starve the miners by rejecting their blocks if they refuse to conform to the new consensus rules that nodes are imposing. Now, this was part of Bitcoin consensus that scammers like Craig Wright, for example, never understood or pretended not to understand when he repeatedly asserted that if you're not mining, your node doesn't matter. This is from a CoinGeek article. You should avoid CoinGeek because it's a BSV site. But in this article, Craig asserts a reminder that if you're not creating blocks, you're not a node on the Bitcoin network. Uh, Dr. Craig S. Wright has hit out again at the notions of non-mining nodes and routing nodes, saying they have little purpose and play no role in securing the network. This sounds a little bit like Bitcoin core supporters who tell you that your node doesn't matter. So it's interesting to hear that echo. Majorian writes here, if the current soft fork proposal is not popular, it will not activate easy. Not sure who included the language about not activating. This puts you in legal peril, but I would not have included that. Soft fork's goal is to bridge a gap at consensus level that version that Bitcoin Core version 30 created. And then Tominaga responds, the only thing that matters is whether the miners adopt it, adopt this new soft fork software, the only real nodes in the system. So he's basically talking like Craig Wright here, Tominaga is. There are 13 that count. In other words, there are 13 that are building their own block templates. If the two major ones take it, that's 50%, three and you're at 70%. After that, it doesn't matter what the rest of the so-called network thinks. Bitcoin consensus isn't democracy. Well, that's true. It's hash power, which is also not true. The rest is theater. This is simply not true that, as he says, Bitcoin consensus is just the hash power. It's just the mining pools and the miners. It's not true because if enough Bitcoin node runners want to enforce a certain rule, for example, like limiting op returns to 83 bytes or trying to limit other forms of arbitrary data and spam, if Bitcoin nodes do this, even the large powerful mining pools like Foundry and Antpool and Friends will be forced to accept the new rule. This is exactly what happened to the large ch Chinese mining pool Bitmain, which also makes all the ASICs, but it happened to them during the block size wars of 2017 when Bitmain panicked in the face of a UASF, a user activated soft fork, and began running the SegWit upgrade, even though they didn't want to run it. So UASF, this is a power of the nodes. You can think of it as sort of grassroots action 
by plebs that has the power to stop even powerful corporations like Coinbase, like Bitmain, like Foundry, like Antpool, etc., from exerting their will on Bitcoin. Now, for example, uh, there's a current example playing out today, which is F2 pool, which is currently 11% of the hash. So approximately 11% of blocks are mined by them. F2 pool was co-founded by Chun Wang. And as we can see, he's on Twitter yesterday saying BIP444, the soft fork that we've been talking about is a bad idea, not going to soft fork anything temporary or not. Feels sad that some devs moving further and further in the wrong direction. And as Luke Dasher responds to him, users, in other words, node runners, decide protocol changes, not miners. You're going to repeat Bitmain's 2017 mistakes. So Luke is basically holding up to them and reminding them of the UASF of 2017 that forced through SegWit and implying that this could happen again, that maybe the hash doesn't control as much power as they think they do. I'll put a link to the soft fork proposal in the description notes below and we can see one of the things it wants to do is limit op returns beyond 83 bytes and if we want to think of the pressure that we can apply to mining pools if we take a look at who's running which node versions core 30 which are really the people who want the large op returns they're only at seven and a half percent of the network we can assume a lot of these people haven't upgraded because they're not paying attention but there are a lot of people who have upgraded or have refused to upgrade to core 30 because they don't like spam on bitcoin and they don't like large op returns. So if you have something like 80, 90% of the network against spam, there's really nothing that mining pools will be able to do about this. And this is really an em empty um, bluff by Chun here saying, not gonna soft fork anything. Well, if you don't follow along, you're not gonna get paid. We nodes are gonna reject your blocks. So this is something that's encouraging. In conclusion, who has the most power in Bitcoin? I would say it's really the people who run the Bitcoin nodes, which are at the heart of the network. It's a Bitcoin network because it's a bunch of nodes and node runners connected to each other. And this is where the real power is. And what Bitcoin mining pools need to recognize is they're staring down the barrel of a lot of very angry people who are tired of spam on Bitcoin. And this is why Bitcoin Knots node runners have moved from 1% of the network to almost 21% of the network over just the past few months. And so this does suggest that there are there is a very vocal minority that is against spam and may be willing to exert their will in the face, even from opposition by large mining pools. If you want to learn how to run a Bitcoin Knots node and help to support this movement and support the network and fight spam on the network, I'll put a link to these free resources in the description notes below, and I'm not being paid to promote any of them, but check out the description notes below. It'll show you how to run your own Bitcoin Knots node on a laptop, a desktop, or on a personal server like the Start9 that you can either buy or build yourself. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to hit the subscribe and like buttons. Hit the notification bell if you want to be notified when I publish my next video. And let me know your questions and comments in the comment section below. Thanks a lot for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.